It's my pleasure to be here tonight. I, I am a great admirer of the Archaeology Cafe and a great admirer of the Center for Desert Archaeology and the outreach programs that they do. And, and in particular, I, I feel very much an affinity to what the center does because they are very interdisciplinary in, what, in the way that they think and the way they are inclusive about preservation. And so I'm, I'm honored to be here tonight to really talk about uh, a sense of place, sustainability, vernacular, some terms that are, are perhaps part of a lexicon that you may have heard of, but this is an opportunity and a venue to really sort of explore the definitions of those words, to talk about some concepts, and then to open it up for some discussion. I will tell you right away that I am handicapped. And the reason I'm handicapped is that I normally use visuals. I'm an architect, I, I, I teach, and I always use PowerPoint. And when I was told that I couldn't use PowerPoint, I felt like an Italian having to tie his hands behind their back, <laughs> that I can't speak. And so Kate graciously allowed me to have a flip chart. And so I may be, I may be referring to it, uh, but if you see me starting to sort of have an itch and kind of do this, it's because I'm very used to having uh, visual crutches to allow me to sort of continue on and give me clues as to where I want to go. So what I've done is I've printed out my PowerPoint <laughs> so that I have some clues to keep me going. Um, what I'd like to do tonight is to talk about something that has been a part of, of my career, and I'll, I'll do a little introduction about where I come from. I was trained as an architect here in, in the University of Arizona. I went away, practiced for a little bit in Southern California. I joined the Peace Corps, and I was in the country of Yemen, which unfortunately has been in the news far more than I would like it to be, at least for the topic um, that I would like it to be. Yemen is a spectacular place for vernacular architecture, and that's the reason I went there. And I was fortunate enough to work as a UNESCO architect uh, working in a world heritage city, Sana'a, the capital. Uh, I was privileged to work with UNESCO uh, in a preservation capacity, and then uh, came back here and was been a faculty member at the University of Arizona since 1988. I started a uh, preservation program, a graduate studies program, at the college and uh, continue to do that. In fact, we're morphing that into um, a much more inclusive program that's called Heritage Conservation. Uh, again, trying to be as inclusive as possible to understand that we're not preserving history necessarily, but we are conserving uh, heritage. And heritage can be broadly termed. And we can talk about that as well. But that all is, ends up being a background for a career in which I have spent documenting and, and attempting to interpret a variety of built environments, and you can contrast that with natural environments, but you talk about built environments, interpreting their significance, and documenting them, and allowing them to be preserved so that future generations would, could benefit from them, both in terms of their functional use as well as interpreting the heritage of our past, as well as uh, giving our current culture meaning. And so with that, I, I want to present tonight's um, topic as sustainability and a sense of place defining a new vernacular. And when the announcement first came out, I realized that uh, somehow there was, a, there was a mistake, probably in my communication, is that I really, it, it came out as defining a new vernacular architecture. And I don't really want to talk about architecture in, uh, exclusively tonight. I really want to talk about defining a new vernacular. And I'll explain a little bit more about that. And so what I'd like to do tonight is is talk about these terms and definitions. And I've, I've written it up here so that we have, again, something to allow us uh, to use as a, as a visual uh, cue. We're going to talk about sustainability. We're going to talk about sense of place. And we're going to talk about vernacular. And as any good sort of lecturer would do, I'm going to sort of define a, a kind of manifesto and try to sort of open it up for some questions beyond that then to really stimulate some conversations about what we can do in this community in particular about defining a new vernacular and really combining the terms and the concepts of sustainability and sense of place to really sort of provide um, a real uh, understanding of who we are and where we are. So let's start off with some definitions. The first one is sustainability. Now we use sustainability quite a bit these days and I want to give you some, uh, a, a basic uh, definition, which is the UN's definition, and that is sustainability is meeting the needs of today without compromising the future. Pretty straightforward, okay? There are some 
some interesting facts that go along with this as it applies to architecture and buildings in the United States. First of all, buildings in the United States consume 39% of total energy consumption. They are 71, they consume 71% of electricity consumption. 39% of carbon dioxide emissions are represented in buildings. And buildings represent 30% of raw material use and waste output. And then uh, buildings also consume 12% of the total potable water consumption. So we're talking about buildings and the building industry as a major consumer of energy, a major consumer of raw virgin materials that have a direct impact on sustainability. And we can talk about sustainability in terms of the principles that may be sort of common terms to you. One is uh, the U.S. Green Building Council. They are a, a national uh, standards uh, board to, uh, which have created a series of standards that are called leadership and, environmental uh, and leadership and Energy and Environmental Design, or LEED. And you'll, you'll see that many buildings are now LEED certified, and there's varying degrees of LEED certification. Here is a regulatory body that is uh, providing a standard by which sustainability can be measured, which is a good start. It also, unfortunately for many of the architecture and design professionals, it is a point chasing opportunity. And so we often sort of go toward where the easiest points are without really understanding the larger holistic understanding of, of design and real true holistic sustainable design. But there are a variety of sustainable principles that I think are really important that people should understand. And they go from varying scales, from the grand scale, the macro scale, all the way down to the very small scale. The first of these principles is site development. And that sustainable site development is that which is oriented toward public transportation and encourages density using the least possible building footprint on the natural environment. And so a suggested um, responses to that in terms of design and in terms of how the built environment can respond to that are things like urban infill or uh, cluster developments where you're really concentrating the development and creating density at the urban scale. I have this great graphic that I wish I could show you. <laughs> but I'll pull it, I'll put it up and, and it's a, it's a great, it's a, I'll describe it. If you look at this picture right here, you'll see that there's an outline of the footprint of the city of Phoenix, the municipal Phoenix. Inside that footprint of Phoenix fits Rome, San Francisco, Paris, and Manhattan. Okay, there's something wrong here. Another sustainable principle is that of water con uh, conservation and that we should be striving for water conservation that harvests the water we receive and conserves the water we use in buildings and the landscape. So here are the strategies that could be incorporated include rainwater harvesting, gray water use, drought tolerant plants, many of the things that we're already doing. Some of the things perhaps that we're not doing or thinking about are pervious paving materials. Instead of having tarmac on all the streets and having runoff of the water and the water goes to Marana, that we can actually think about having the water stay on the site as long as possible and even having uh, per permeable uh, uh, paving surfaces to do that. And of course, low use plumbing fixtures. And again, those have become much more part of the mainstream that you'd find in any home improvement store. Another of these sustainable pr st sustainability principles is energy use. That includes passive design strategies. By that we mean non-mechanical for the most part. So passive design strategies includes the creation of microclimates. So for example, we're sitting in a microclimate. The idea that we've created an enclosed area, we can introduce humidity, we can uh, have natural ventilation. These are all design principles that can be incorporated to reduce energy consumption and create a much more thermally comforting uh, space. We can orient our buildings toward uh, solar gain in the winter when we want it to be and for shading in the summer when we don't want it to be. Thermal mass, which is the mass of walls that, uh, that, that delay or temper the amount of heat that goes from the exterior to the interior, and understanding that we live in a climate that has extreme temperature swings from winter to summer and from day to night. So thermal mass becomes an important tool then to allow us to temper that shifting from day to night and from season to season. 
little things like window placement. You know, we all know we shouldn't put windows on the west side, right? You know, but still we have windows that do that. Uh, understanding where the placement of windows in any opening should be. Shading devices. Okay? The idea that you know, we should be having shading devices over all of our buildings and understanding where there should be shade and where we should be opening it up. Little things like double pane windows, appliances, light bulbs, you name it. There are other active strategies. We just talked about passive strategies, but there's also active strategies. These include photovoltaic energy, PVs, uh, solar panels. Uh, we can use them for hot water, which is becoming uh, much more common. And of course, there are now financial incentives to do that. And even the new technology that's out there are solar roof shingles, which I think is just going to just revolutionize the way in which we begin to take a look at that. The other thing is, is one, and when we talk about energy use, we're also talking about not only dealing with the buildings. You know, the, the famous architect Le Corbusier talked about um, having uh, active buildings and passive man, is the way he put it. So in other words, you know, we live in a society of leisure and we sort of sit and our building works as a machine. It works as a machine in order to do all the things that we just talked about, that it adjusts from day to night, it adjusts from season to season, and all we have to do is sit back and be passive and enjoy the leisure of our culture. Well, I would, I would tend to argue that it should actually be the opposite, is that we should begin to think about active man or active human uh, and a passive house, and that we are actually engaging with our climate in a way that perhaps we haven't done in the past. We've allowed technology to sort of take over and neutralize the kinds of things that we typically take for granted then. Another of these sustainability principles has to do with building materials. And this gets into the technology of what we're talking about. But also it deals with the entire system of how buildings, or I'm sorry, how building materials are extracted and whether or not they're virgin materials or whether or not they're reused materials, how these are extracted and then processed and the amount of energy that it takes to extract those materials, whether we're talking about wood, which is common for our houses today, or concrete or cement um, and, and glass, steel, all of these things have a process, a, an extraction process of raw materials that we're taking away from our planet, a processing and fabrication energy consumption that it takes, and then we have to talk about their manufacturing into the, the actual building equipment and, and materials that we use, their transportation from where they are to where we want them to be, and then installation processes. All of these take energy, and they take an incredible amount of energy, particularly if the raw materials are in one part of the country or the world, and the actual building takes place in another. And then we have to think about landfill waste. The idea that we have buildings that, if we destroy buildings, that we have buildings that are being dumped into the landfill. All their raw materials, all that embodied energy. We're also talking about the packaging of materials. Anybody who goes to any supermarket, Costco, you name it, the amount of packaging that goes with the actual material that you'll consume, whether it's food or an uh, appliance, is just astronomical. That all goes into a landfill. That all becomes waste that needs to be processed, and that requires energy. And we're also talking about the idea of locally available, renewable, or if we're talking about strategies then, we can talk about recycling buildings, okay, the actual buildings themselves. We can talk about recycled building materials to be reused, and also locally available materials and even renewable virgin materials. So it's just a way of thinking that we need to get all of the industries and the consumer, everything from the homeowner to the architects, to the building industries, to the developers, to the manufacturers, to begin to rethink the way in which we do this. And finally, in terms of, of LEED certification, we talk about inner, indoor air quality and, and the recognition that there are uh, the effect of toxins that are in our paints, in our carpets, and in a variety of different finishes that we put on building materials that we need, again, to rethink. And so the, 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 the concept of VOCs, or volatile um, organic compounds, are the things that you need to watch out for. And now again, they're becoming much more popular. You can go to your home improvement store and you can look for low or no VOCs, and you can begin to contribute to a building industry that is uh, beginning to change. Again, recognizing that all of this has an effect on not only our energy sustainability, but our own personal health, and it becomes very important. I also want to spend a little bit of time talking about building reuse. Now, I'm a preservationist, 
Okay? I, I like preservation because it's green. It's very sustainable. But we're also talking about not just preserving historic buildings or buildings that we have deemed as being architecturally or historically significant, but building reuse in general. And in, in other words, it's an understanding that there is a whole building stock that's out there that is open for reuse. And recently, you know, there's been a variety of big boxes that have closed shop. These are great, what Stuart Brand calls loose fitting buildings. These sort of warehouse like buildings that have plenty of opportunity for reuse. And we need to, again, rethink about how we do that. All the way to the most recent uh, school closing through so TUSD. The, the idea that we have these, these buildings that are sitting on vast open campuses that we need to reuse. And we have to think about this as a society as to what, how we use these kinds of spaces and these buildings but also get into an ethic that we need to reuse them for, for a variety of other purposes. And of course, as I said before, these buildings represent embodied energy. It took energy to create the bricks, for the wood, for the steel sash windows, for the shingles, for everything. And they, that energy is embodied in them. For us to destroy those, throw them into a landfill, and then extract new virgin materials, new fabrication processes, and create new buildings is just silly. It's just absolute ludicrousy. Now, I, one of my favorite movies, and I didn't realize until I had kids that, you know, I didn't watch animated movies, but of course, Pixar has changed all of that, and now <laughs> movies can be available and, and actually entertaining for adults as well as they are for children. So one of my favorite movies now is Robots. So if you haven't had a chance to see robots, I would highly recommend it because it's all about that. It's about the idea that there's this big, ugly corporate guy that's coming in and wants to, wants to get rid of all these old robots and forget about repairing them, you know, forget about putting new parts in, on them, get rid of them. We want something that's new and shiny. And it really was a commentary on, and of course Mel Brooks was in it, so of course it has something. <laughs> Mel Brooks was, the, was uh, one of the corporate guys that was there, his voice at least. And, and it's really talking about this ethic of reuse and, and how we have become as consumers and in the richest consumerist society in the world, how we have gone into an ethic of consumerism at, at, the, at the expense of all of these other materials and appliances and variety of different equipment that we just throw away. All right, I also want to talk about sustainability on another term. It's time for me to flip the chart. And when we talk about sustainability, we've been really talking about environmental sustainability. And it's really important that we understand the, the sort of principles of environmental sustainability. But most of you have probably heard now that there is a triple bottom line when we talk about sustainability. We're talking about not only environmental sustainability, but we're also talking about social sustainability. The idea that there is, a, there is an equity about social, um, uh, social development and social um, uh, equity toward uh, the, the human capital that is part of our world in terms of how we develop our commerce, how we develop our, our building uh, industries as well. There's also the economic sustainability. And certainly now, in corporations are becoming much more aligned with the understanding that sustainability from an environmental standpoint is also economically sustainable because there is now uh, a, a, an ethic that is, is allowing that to be given economic credibility as well as environmental credibility. But there's an understanding too that in this Venn diagram that I'm showing, it, there are relationships. And there are relationships between environmental sustainability and economic sustainability. And that frankly, if we are going to be talking about sustainable communities, we have to have sustainable environment and socially sustainable uh, society and an economically sustainable society. We can't just think about environmental sustainability. And in a report that was done by Dom Ripkema, who is a preservation econo econo economist, he talked about the, this Venn diagram and the relationships between them. And I thought it was incredibly important, so I'm, I'm giving him credit. This is not my idea. But the idea that if you have an environmentally sustainable community and an economically sustainable community, you have a viable community. And that in order to have an equitable community, you need to have a social sustainability and economic sustainability. And finally, if you want to have a livable community, a livable, sustainable community, 
you need to have environmental sustainability and social sustainability. So this idea that we have these intersecting circles then that create these other qualities that allow us to then begin to understand the relationship between economic, social, and environmental sustainability. And in the middle of that Venn diagram is really the idea of community, a sustainable community. And that we can't think about a sustainable community without understanding all of the various <coughs> factors that are a part of that. But this, this holistic thinking requires trade-offs. Okay, it requires lifestyle trade-offs, it requires other kinds of trade-offs. And these are the things that personally we need to embrace. So we can't just talk about these things in abstract, but we have to begin to understand their effect on our current lifestyle and the way that we have been raised to, to think in terms of a value system. And it becomes really important to understand what those value systems are. All right, I would now like to talk about the next definition if we go back to the we just talked about sustainability. I'd like to talk about sense of place. Now, when we talk about sense of place, uh, it, it really, one of the things I, I love talking about is, it, it, as I said before in my career, I've been talking about how I document and interpret. And there's a double entendre here that I want to, to share with you is that I, I feel like part of my career is making sense of place. The idea that we are trying to interpret what that meaning is of place. But as architects, as designers, as a variety of people who contribute to the built environment, we're also talking about making sense of place. In other words, the idea of community, a place that has character and conveys the value of place. And it's an understanding of that double entendre that becomes really important that you can't necessarily make sense of place unless you understand the core root values and the character that defines that place in order to make places, in order to do place making, which is, I think, most of the architects and urban designers and planners really think that they're talking about, that they're place making. In other words, places that have value and have character. So we can talk about the sense of place then and define it as the connection between tangible characteristics of an environment, whether they're natural or a built environment, and the intangible values of that environment that gives it meaning. Let me say that again. The connection between tangible characteristics of an environment, the things you can touch, okay, whether it's trees, landscapes, geographic features, buildings, landscapes, uh, a uh, variety of different urban elements, and the intangible values that give it meaning. Okay? The idea that we have a variety of intangible values that we hold to the way in which we define meaning as a culture. The whole notion of community. Community is a humanistic construct. Okay? We aren't born into community. We create community because we need to survive as social beings. The idea of meaning itself. Your meaning of a place may be very different than mine. It's a humanistic construct. And as I teach in my preservation classes, much of preservation is based on defining significance. Is that building significant? Is that landscape or that urban environment significant? I don't know. It is for me. I don't know about for you. And I have to figure out a way to make that intangible construct of significance meaningful for other people that they not only have, to, they don't necessarily have to share my value system, but they have to understand the tangible elements that create that sense of place and significance for that. These are incredibly difficult things, and if, if you know, you should hug your preservationists because <laughs> they're the ones who, who are really in charge of, of understanding that significance and beginning to interpret those meanings in our culture and beginning to understand what we preserve and what, uh, what we need to do in order to do that. So if we talk about these intangible values, I've listed some that I often use as a way of describing not only um, the values of our particular uh, culture, but also of our built environment. And I use this as a thematic framework whenever I talk about uh, a history of the built environment in Tucson, in the Southwest, um, even in the world. Because we can begin to understand that there are various values that are expressed in the built environment, in the architecture, in the urban planning, in the, in the way in which cities and buildings are framed. So there are environmental values, 
Okay? These are the things that are defined by our geography, whether it's the climate, whether it's the, uh, the way in which the, the dryness or whether there's an existence or non-existence of water. All of those become a determinant and a value by which we create a built environment. We have function, the relationship between task and the space itself. Culture, the, the societal structure, the belief systems, this notion that I talked about before, this idea we, um, uh, Bill Doley and I were, and, and a variety of other people in this room, were at a conference for the National Trust for Historic Preservation in Austin. And one of the keynote speakers was talking about what does it take in order for us to, to develop a sense of community, okay? And that community, in, in, and I think in, in the speaker's mind, was an inherent sort of value, when in fact community is a construct. It's the idea that we have to create our own sense of community. And it may be different in different cultures. And we have to understand that there is a very strong force, particularly in this culture in the United States, of individualism. And so you define our urban environment. You can take a look around at our single detached, single story detached kind of uh, existence of, of suburban neighborhoods. And you can see that this is the embodiment of individualism. And it's been growing out of our, our cultural background and is manifest in the way in which we lay out our our cities and our individual buildings. We also have technological values. Those, we define technologies not as gizmos, but really as tools from, from the, the ancient peoples all the way up to current time. They had to create tools in order to sustain themselves, sustain themselves as a culture, sustain themselves as an economic uh, force. And these are the ways in which that we can begin to understand everything from farming that allowed people to sustain themselves in the Tucson Basin, all the way to tools to, correct, uh, to construct buildings, and even now tools to, to help us save energy in a variety of other ways in which technology is, is um, expressed. We have economic value systems. I would argue today if you were to give primacy to any one of these sort of value systems that defines our culture, it really is on economic. We have an economic value system that's based on, in a capitalistic uh, marketplace where it defined our, our individualism but also the idea that we are creating um, buildings that are not based on their long-lasting, enduring quality in our culture, but rather we're talking about buildings and land as commodity and that that is driven by, it drives the big box developers, it drives these out of town developers who really don't have a sense and rootedness here in place, but rather are here to exploit the land and the resources in order for them to make a buck. There are political value systems. And when you talk about political value systems, I need to go back to the real core definition of what politic is. It's really you know, what this notion of pro bono for the public good the idea that we are creating regulations in many cases that ensure our health safety, ensure fire codes, ensure a variety of other issues that begin to have a regulatory um, expression, but are really a, a, an expression of our, our political values and how we begin to uh, define those and the regulations that govern ourselves. And finally, aesthetic, which I uh, had trouble spelling, as you'll see, <laughs> of all things. And this is what you know, Vitruvius would call, and, and what I would interpret as delight, the idea that there is delight in, in the way in which we take a look at nature. We, I flew in, I don't know about the rest of you who came in from Austin, I flew in and I flew in over the, uh, the Rincon Mountains coming from Austin, Texas. And we've, I flew in and there was, you can see in the San Pedro Valley the, the desert and it gets into scrub and then it gets into the into the pines and the, and the evergreen forests. And then there it was, this, this beautiful patch of aspens that was just turning yellow. And it was just this most beautiful thing. And that we see aesthetics in nature, but we also see aesthetics in a variety of, of built environments too. I'm a great fan, as Damien is, of neon. And so we talk about neon as giving delight, you know, the idea of aesthetic. Yes, it has a function. Yes, it's a sign but it also gives delight in a variety of ways. And that we can't, we can't uh, just let go of delight as one of the value systems that, that gives us pleasure as human beings. So here we have this, this matrix, this sort of framework in which we can begin to use as lenses to take a look at our built environment and our natural environment. And these represent value systems that we can begin to say as we look at cultures throughout history that there's a primacy 
given to one value system over another. And we can read that particular primacy, that particular value system, by taking a look at the built expressions of culture of that time. So it's easy for us to take a look at cliff dwellings, for example, okay, of the Puebloan peoples, and begin to see that there was an environmental primacy in, in the architecture and the built environment which they did. Obviously, they had to worry about function. They had to worry about cultural expression. They used technology in order to build their buildings, as well as economic, political, and aesthetic values. But you can read the primacy of environmental value systems in that kind of buildings. And again, today, if you, I would challenge you to, to use this as a framework to understand and take a look at your own built environment today and understand where that primacy is. And I'm going to bet you, very soon, we're going to return to the environmental. We have to worry about where our water is coming from. We have to begin to take a look at, at energy sources that are outside of the petroleum um, dependency that we currently have, which means that we need to, to take advantage of our environment to give us the kind of energy that we can to as much as a degree as possible. <clears throat> All right. So next on our list of definitions, we've gone through sustainability and sense of place. I'd now like to talk about vernacular. Now, vernacular often does refer to architecture, and I'm, I'm a big fan of vernacular architecture. And it's really funny when we, uh, when we fill out inventory forms for the State Historic Preservation Office. It used to be that you'd fill out the form and you would have to say, what style is it? And so you sort of figure out a style. Is it Gothic? Is it you know, uh, Spanish colonial? And you know, there's a whole list, a prescribed list of things. And then there was always this box that said vernacular. <laughs> it was almost like this other that was this all-encompassing, if it wasn't you know, sort of part of these very defined kinds of things, it had to be vernacular. And those of you who, who have heard my lectures before about vernacular architecture know that in my definition between the understanding of, of these styles that we talk about, it's like bird watching. Okay? If it's got a, a yellow breast and a crooked beak, then it's got to be a yellow-breasted wobbler. And we can begin to identify style as classification of elements into a holistic thing. Now, what is vernacular? Well, I like to use the metaphor of Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> because we can talk about Mr. Potato Head and we talk about vernacular in the same way, is that we've got a sort of a body, this lump of a potato, and that is its form. But over time, based on the sort of functional needs, the cultural expression of a particular time, even the economics, there's a variety of different appendages and morphing that's done of this particular form that doesn't fit into that bird watching categorization, but rather is this sort of, you know, oftentimes we'd see this sort of Mr. Potato Head that has a mustache and a purse, okay, <laughs> that perhaps doesn't make sense, but in fact represents the value systems of that particular potato head, okay? Are you with me on this one? Yeah, Okay, good, all right. So there is an encyclopedia of vernacular world architecture, and in that there is a definition of vernacular that says vernacular architecture, in this case, comprises the buildings of the people related to their environmental contexts and available resources. They are customarily owner or community built utilizing traditional technologies. All forms of vernacular architecture are built to meet specific needs, accommodating the values, economies, and way of living of cultures that produce them. Okay, now that's an academic sort of definition of vernacular. Okay? Now, there are also a variety of other definitions of vernacular that I like to incorporate because I'm wanting to change the frame of reference about how we define vernacular. Oftentimes vernacular is, and particularly as it relates to architecture, is defined as anonymous. It's not big name sort of hero architects making statements um, about a particular building, or it's not stylistically definable, is that that is a Spanish colonial revival building, but in fact represent the, the values of the people who are making it. And one of the important things to understand between in, in vernacular architecture is that oftentimes the buildings are not very far away from the owners or the construction of the buildings are not far away from the owners themselves. 
So it wasn't that long ago that the person who owned that particular property then worked with his or her hands and built the adobes, built the walls, put the beams up, and were carrying on building traditions that were carried on down through the generations based on their memory of how those buildings were built. This wasn't some outside academic interest coming in saying, no, 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 that's not the way you build buildings. It was of a particular culture and representing that. And this idea that the actual building and the builders and the owners were not very far away. Today, however, we have an owner, we oftentimes have a, a representative of the owner, we have an architect, we have uh, 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 sub-consultants to the architect, a landscape architect, interior designer, then we have a structural engineer, then we have a general contractor, then we have a subcontractor for electrical, we have a subcontractor for plumbing. You see my point, is that we're beginning to remove ourselves away from the actual skills and the trades that begin to construct the buildings that we occupy. The other definitions of, of, of vernacular, really, I, and I want to sort of, again, to sort of change that frame of reference, has to do with the linguistic definition of vernacular. When someone is sort of speaking the vernacular, they're really talking about place. The idea that a vernacular really is a representation of, you know, when you hear a Mainer talk, okay, you know he or she is a Mainer, okay? Somebody from the South, somebody from the West, somebody from the UK. They're speaking a vernacular that represents the place where they came from and the traditions that generated the way in which they express themselves, in this case, linguistically. So when we're talking about defining a vernacular, we can talk about it in a linguistic sense, and it broadens this idea of understanding how we create this expression that we have, particularly as it comes to our entire um, expression of, of cultural um, artifacts, and including buildings, landscapes, and a variety of other things. J.B. Jackson, who is a cultural geographer, now dead, unfortunately, was a real force in his field. And he, he wrote a definition of vernacular he also wrote a book called The Necessity of Ruin, which is one of my favorite books. And if you're looking for a book on J.B. Jackson, it's a very good book. But he talks about vernacular cultural landscapes. Okay, vernacular cultural landscapes. And he defined vernacular as the cultural expressions of and defined by the particular qualities of place. Okay, so we have going back to this notion of place and sense of place as being a way in which we do this. But I have to remind everyone that places are not monolithic. They are not, um, they are not of one particular layers. But in places like Tucson, we are really in a tell in the Middle Eastern sense of the word, is that we have a series of layers of cultures that represent this particular place. And so we can't divorce place without also, uh, talking about the idea of periods of time and that for each of those layers of our place, we have value systems that expressed all of the other uh, value systems and determinants that we've been talking about before. So we talk about place, and like a Tucson, we're talking about a, an expression that really is rich in that layered approach. And we have to drill down and really to understand the cultural expressions of this particular place at any one particular period of time. Okay, now we've talked about sustainability, we've talked about sense of place, we've talked about vernacular. You still with me? Yes. All right, good. At least the hecklers at the front table are with me. That's good. Hey, we've been good. <laughs> so what I'd like to do now is to really talk about a new vernacular, defining a new vernacular based on those sort of definitions that we talked about. And in this, I'm going to talk about it in three different categories. One is values, okay? Defining a new vernacular in terms of values, in terms of design strategies, and in terms of policy. Now, those of us in, in the design professions often sort of look at design as the end all. That if, as long as we design it, then it will happen. But in, unfortunately, it doesn't always happen that way. And in fact, we have to become um, good friends with policy because we cannot, uh, we have to understand the political and the economic aspects of the value systems that govern our particular uh, way of being in our culture. And if we want to change our built environment, it's not just a design thing. 
but rather one in which we need to understand the regulatory and the economic values that go into creating the built environment, and particularly those rules that govern how we, um, how we build new uh, in, in our environments. So first, I'd like to talk about values. When I, um, uh, after I, I published a book, uh, co-authored co, um, co a book with Annie Niquette called A Guide to Tucson Architecture. So all of a sudden, I, I became famous. And I uh, sort of had, a, had people calling me up and saying, we want your opinion about this, and we want your opinion about that. And um, one day, the people that called up were the city of Tucson and the planning department. And they said, could you help us define, we're right in the middle of defining our, our development standards and our design guidelines for Rio Nuevo. <laughs> Can you help us define Tucson-centric architecture? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> How do you do that? How do you define Tucson-centric architecture? I said, give me a couple of weeks. So I sort of you know, thought about it for a little bit and went back into the, the kinds of understandings that I had because I knew that if this were to, to go, it would, it would be something that would be published. And so this is what I came up with. And it really is about values. It's not about architecture. It's about the values. Is that Here's how I defined it then. That the new vernacular, or you can even talk about uh, the built environment or appropriate architecture in Tucson, is based on the conservation of and inspiration from the natural resources of the desert place, right? The idea of land, climate, plants, water. All of those things need to be embodied in our architecture, in our built environment. The other definition, again, which was a value system, is that good, appropriate design for this place is about the cumulative design knowledge represented in the many cultures whose built environment has responded to this desert place. So in other words, it's not just about one style, not just about vigas and clay tile, it's not just about one particular period of time, but that every period who has been forced to sustain themselves in this place has responded to it in a variety of different ways from which we can learn. And that unless we have an understanding of that comprehensive layered approach to the design responses that have happened over the past few years, over the past few millennia, that we're not really understanding the full breadth of what we can do for today. And that really was my definition of, and gave it back to them. And you can see it's been plastered on billboards all over. They really, they really liked it a lot. What, of course, what they wanted was uh, clay tiles, vigas, uh, and brown stucco. And, and that's really what they wanted in terms of they wanted a style as opposed to really understanding the, the, the notion of, of a value system that did not hand tie designers, that did not hand tie developers into one style like a Santa Fe or a Santa Barbara but rather understanding the eclectic, beautiful, eclectic quality that makes Tucson what it is. So those are values. We can also talk about design strategies, and we can talk about them on a variety of different levels, and this is kind of a summary of what we've already talked about. One is the idea of connecting nature with the city. The idea that in order to understand living in this place, we have to understand that we live in a place that is rich in its nature, but we've erased it. And so for all of its faults, Rio Nuevo was attempting to reconnect the river, reconnect the reason why Tucson is here. Okay, the reason Tucson is here is because of water. water. And the Hohokam came because of water. And the Spanish came because the Hohokam were here because the Hohokam came here because of water, etc. And that we need to understand that connection to nature. And the understanding that I often show a slide uh, of the Santa Cruz or the entire Tucson Basin and showing the Santa Cruz River uh, Basin and the Rito and understanding that the, the native peoples settled along the rivers because they needed to. Their cognitive map and understanding was directly focused on the, the, the element that sustained them, water. Today, we've erased that. Okay? We sometimes don't even know we're crossing over a river. It's dry, we have bridges that go over it, we don't even go down into the rivers at all anymore. And we have a grid of a, of a lay, street layout that really divorces us 
from that sense of nature. The other urban design strategy is density and transit-oriented infill development. This is, this is going to become a reality. There are now federal programs that are incentivizing this, but it also not only makes sense, but it's also going to make sense in terms of we're bringing light rail and we're bringing much higher density to particular urban nodes or cores that we need to begin to define. Obviously downtown, there'll be a core at the university. We begin to understand where those nodes are going to be and we can begin to understand place making within those particular nodes and creating an urban infrastructure that allows us to become pedestrians in this city again. And that means that we need to build infrastructure that allows the pedestrian to feel comfortable. Shade networks, for example, landscaping. We're not just talking about sort of big, huge canopies over everything, but we're talking about shade networks of, of trees and integrating landscape in a way that we really haven't done in a strategic way. We've taken a look at landscape in this town more as an aesthetic than as a function to go back to these sort of value systems. So if we take a look at shade and landscape as a function, we can begin to understand it as a great tool to help us build that. Building reuse, as I said before, so that we take a look at buildings as embodied energy. Water harvesting and conservation. That has to happen. We've already got now a code in place for commercial buildings and residential buildings. We need to start thinking of it at an urban scale now too and begin to understand how water can be saved and, and actually be part of the delight of being here. I mean, I, the first thing I do in the first monsoon storm, I go out my porch, it's got a tin roof, pop open a cold beer and just listen to the rain and just understand that you know, there is an aesthetic quality to that here and that we need to celebrate water in this community. We can also talk about design strategies for buildings. So as we talked about before, orientation, building form, smaller footprints, you know, the idea that when we read a landscape, when we read a building, can we read which side faces south? We can't always. The idea that shade isn't always appropriate, it isn't always appropriately designed on buildings to understand that the sun acts in a particular way throughout the day and, and changes with the seasons. And our buildings, our landscape should reflect that. We should be having trees that, that drop their leaves in the wintertime so that we have sun and that provide shade in the, in the uh, summertime. There are things that are much more intentional that we need to begin to think about, as well as building materials, as I said before, reusing building materials and providing building materials that are renewable. We can also incorporate technology. Technology is our friend, and we need to embrace it as a, as a tool in which to, to help in this process. We should not become um, over-dominated by technology, but rather use it as an integrated tool in helping us as, as part of an overall comprehensive strategy. This has to do with building materials and the invention of new materials that helps us with this, but also infrastructure, transportation infrastructure. You know, our town, as it's been said many times before, has not been created by those people who have been designed for its, its aesthetic. It's been designed by transportation engineers to get people from point A to point B as quickly as and efficiently as possible. That has nothing to do with aesthetics. It has nothing to do with creating pedestrian oriented places. We need to begin to orient our technology in a way that allows us to, to create these kinds of spaces. And finally, going back to policy too, we need to begin to address growth. Yes, we need to control growth. We need to understand that we have in the definition of sustainability, we only have a certain number, amount of resources. We need to understand what that limit is and understand our sustainability capacity in this community as well as the rest of our, of our country. But we need to know how much water do we have? How many more years of growth at the current rate can we afford in order before we completely go bust? And again, if we take the lessons of previous cultures, we'll see that it was environmental forces that forced them out where they are. Okay? We also need to think about other ways in terms of policy of ways in which we regulate the built environment. A, a recent phenomenon has been form-based codes, for example. Form-based codes. What are form-based codes? Well, I'm really glad you asked that. <laughs> form-based codes are really uh, based on, in other words, we, we currently use land use as our zoning codes, right? Land use, in other words, function. Okay, the idea that we can't have houses next to factories, right? 
so we design our, our zoning regulatory system based on land use as opposed to the way in which buildings and our environments create a more dense environment, transit-oriented uh, environment. So we have our, our regulatory system is actually against many of the principles that we, we want to uh, implement in terms, of, um, in terms of environmental sustainability as well as economic and social sustainability. So I, I brought up this definition of what form-based codes are. Form-based codes Let's see if I can find it. Form-based codes contrast the conventional zoning focus on the micromanagement and segregation of land uses and control the development intensity through abstract and uncoordinated parameters such as floor area ratios, dwellings per acre, setbacks, parking ratios. Okay? All of these things are what guide urban development in this town to the neglect of integrated building form. So the best, the best example I like to show is that when you go down to the barrio, okay, there's a form-based code right there. The idea we have buildings that are designed in a block, the Sonoran Row House, but it's actually designed as an entire perimeter building. And inside is a large block level, sort of courtyard, that creates a microclimate. You can plant trees there, you can have water there that begins to shade and begins to provide a microclimate that is perfectly in line with adapting to this place and the climatic extremes of this place. You could not build the barrio today. Our current code system does not allow that. So here we have a farm-based code in the barrio, which was used to create and provide a variety of, of, of functional, variety of climatic, technological kinds of, 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 of determinants. And now what we're talking about really is one that's based on individual land use and the separation of various land use, setbacks, floor area ratios. You have to have X number of parking, which of course creates these vast oceans of parking in front of large big box buildings. We need to rethink that. We also have to think about other kinds of regulatory tools. So for example, I mentioned before Rio Nuevo and, and the creation of design guidelines. Okay? These aren't... Um, prescriptive guidelines saying you must do X, Y, and Z, but rather performance-based. So in other words, they're wanting to have on the street transparency so that when you're walking down the street, you have an understanding in a, a close to a shop that you can look through it. Or that shade, it didn't say how shade should be done, but that shade should be provided. Okay, in other words, catering to, uh, to a pedestrian. We can begin to create these regulatory instruments to make that happen, but it needs to happen at a policy level. It can't just be by the architects, designers, urban planners, landscape architects. There has to be a policy um, portion to it. And we're already adopting some of those. LEED, again, for example. The university has adopted LEED Silver as its minimum. And remember, we've already just opened up the campus rec center as LEED Platinum. So there are institutions that are beginning to adopt that and beginning to run with it. And the city of Tucson now and the state of Arizona are also doing that. And also water conservation. We have water conservation codes now in this community. These are all great. We also have to think about economics. And, this, and by this, we're talking about social sustainability as well as economic sustainability. But again, in order to make communities equitable, in order to make communities viable, we need to have that notion of social sustainability and economic sustainability. We need to have affordable housing in a way that gives nobility, gives, gives um, a certain, um, uh, gives an essence of, of having a home to those um, who do not have the resources to have single family homes. So we need to begin to think about affordable housing and the tools in order to make that happen. We also have to talk about enduring value when we talk about economics. So we don't talk about land and buildings as a commodity but rather the investment in the next generation of buildings and landscapes so that we can begin to have this become a generation and another layer, another legacy that we add to the next generation in order to determine the values of our generation. Right now, if we were all to disappear and all that were left were the anthropologists in 100 years from now, they could clearly see what our value system was in this culture. We need to begin to change that. 
It starts with our children. It starts with, our, with the built environment in which we're, we're trying to, to train them to live in and, and become a part of a, a new kind of environment. And finally, I want to sort of end on, on sort of a, a pitch, and that is that I am uh, the director of the Drachman Institute at the College of Architecture and Landscape Architecture at the University of Arizona. I took over for Corky Poster a little over a year ago. I'm very proud to be in that position because it is doing the kinds of things that um, I think our a university, particularly those, the kind of university that has a, a mission toward uh, outreach and is a land-grant university, it has a mission to reach out into the community and provide that nexus between the expertise and the research uh, that is available at the, at the university and extend it out into the community and begin to develop regulatory instruments, to develop design guidelines, to develop educational tools that can begin to raise awareness in the community in order to make that happen. And I'm very proud to take over um, in that position because the Darkman Institute has had a long tradition of creating these kinds of publications and doing this kind of outreach work. And I hope to continue to do that. And one of them is being here with you tonight. And I'm really proud to be here and I would like to just sort of end it there and kind of open it up for some questions at this point. Thank you. Okay, very rich food for thought tonight. Um, I'll go ahead and start taking questions in the crowd. Again, if you could raise your hand. If you don't feel comfortable about asking your question out loud, there are pads of paper and pens on all the tables. Feel free to write your question down and I'll uh, walk by and grab the questions and read them a little bit later. And I see we've got our first question right over here. I'm guessing that most of the people here tonight were already interested in sustainability. What would you, or do you have any thoughts about how do you talk to people who are not yet interested in sustainability and how do we get them interested? Yeah, it is a good question. And, and I think part of it is the understanding who your audience is. And so when you talk about sustainability, you can talk about it from an environmental standpoint. You can, you can throw out a variety of numbers in order to have them understand very close to home what it takes for them to, to put on the air conditioner for a long period of time and the energy consumption that's there. For them to take a look at, as I said, the, the, the tangible things that I mentioned before, when you open up a package, all of that stuff goes to waste. When you talk about sustainability, you can talk about energy, you can talk about building materials, but you also need to be talking about those, the, the social and the, and the uh, economic one. And those are the things that aren't necessarily part of, I think, the general audience's understanding. So I think sustainability from an environmental standpoint is out there. I, I think people get that. It's this notion of social sustainability, the idea of you know, giving dignity to people who who don't have housing right now, and, and that, that is a, it's a social issue that we need to deal with. It's not just an architectural one, it's not just a, uh, a land use one. And so those are harder things to sell to, depending on your audience. Those who are homeless get it, and we need to provide uh, that kind of social sustainability. Did I answer your question? Not really, because the homeless probably aren't voting today. And what I'm interested in understanding is for those people who did go out and vote today and vote for unsustainable candidates, <laughs> what, what, can I say, what can I say to them? That's, I, I think the rational argument perhaps isn't enough, but I need to find a way to reach people who don't care about these areas. Well, I, I think the key word there is rational. <laughs> Is that it, you know if you're dealing with people who, um, well, I, without getting into sort of political sort of <laughs> realms here, you, you can uh, you can begin to to say education is the key. And you know a, an uneducated electorate is is going to give you the results of an uneducated electorate. Hi, I read in the papers how uh, consumption is two-thirds of the uh, economy and that uh, if people don't consume enough, there will be a recession. And uh, the dynamic of our society seems to have endlessly, or need actually, to survive, to sustain itself endlessly more and more. 
consumption. You, when you were talking in your chapter, or little section on sustainability, ultimately uh, gave the implication, at least, that that kind of ever-growing dynamic is incompatibility with the nexus of environmental, social, and economic sustainability. So how does that, in effect, square with the capitalist system that we, in fact, have today? <laughs> okay, we go from politics to economics then. <laughs> I, I think part of this is an understanding that, um, you know, these terms like capitalistic and socialism and, and these are loaded terms. We, we live in a socialist culture. We have things that are provided for us by the government. And we need to begin to understand where is it appropriate for free market to take over? And where is it, where is it appropriate for, for uh, government or the public, let's call it the public, begins to understand the, uh, uh, for the common good that we need to provide certain things, that for the common good we need health care, for the common good we need an education system that is of good quality, for the common good we need pedestrian environments because we as a culture are becoming obese. And unless we have pedestrian environments, there's a direct relationship between not having sidewalks and not having shade and not having parks to our obesity. And so, you know, there, there, it can go all the way to the public health realm. And so I, it, it's hard for me to make an argument except to say that we need, we're out of balance. And that I'm not anti-market, free market, I'm not anti-capitalist. But I think we need to come more in balance and understand that for the public good, we need to begin to understand what are the things that should be provided for the public by the government that is elected by the people. Okay, I'm gonna take a moderator's advantage here. Um, what would you think are the, the key policy decisions that could be made in Tucson to start moving towards a more sustainable uh, vernacular system here? I, I, One I or think, two would be great. Yeah, uh, you don't want five. One <laughs> would <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think the. I think the most radical one would be form-based codes. I, I think that that would begin to change change a whole lot of things. Obviously, we can talk about transit-oriented development. Certain, there are infill strategies. There are a variety of different things that actually were very well articulated in the design guidelines for Rio Nuevo that really begin to address some of these issues. But I think the land, the, the, I'm sorry, the form-based codes would be really a good start to that because we can begin to understand that it's not about one use next to another, but it's about how it creates a public, how a private building creates a public realm, whether it's on the sidewalk, on the street, or in a public place. And currently our land use code does not allow that to happen. Uh, that, that's a beautiful lead in for me to ask you to flip back to your Venn diagram. And values, values, values. And we're talking reality here in Tucson and those three circles in the Venn diagram overlap. Can you give us an example from our own town that we could say this is where it is. This is where the three of these overlap. I, I was there when you saw this diagram done on a, on a board and got really excited about it. I'd love to see a, uh, a real example of where the three of them overlap here so we can use that as an example to move forward. Yeah, I, you know, one of the things that I'm looking at, and, and the jury is still out, but I'm looking at some of the new housing that's going on downtown. You know, the new MLK, and, and you know, there, for those of you who don't know it, the new buildings there are, A, the, they took the old uh, Martin Luther King building and they, they redid it. It wasn't historic, it wasn't significant, um, but they chose to reuse it. And, and then also the idea that they're putting environmentally sustainable building materials, they're, they're uh, in the new building, they're using LEED standards, but also the idea that um, they are uh, creating a, 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 a social experiment, if you want to say, uh, beginning to mix um, market rate housing with subsidized housing. And this is a grand social experiment. You know, what we used to do, we used to put them over in somewhere else. You know, there, were, there was the projects. 
and where subsidized housing was segregated from, from the rest of our culture and our society. So this is a grand experiment. And you know, frankly, the jury is still out on whether or not it works. And so our challenge is to begin to sort of see this as an ideal, <coughs> test it, and then come back and reevaluate. Um, your, your thought and your suggestion and your exhortation to form-based codes is very exciting, but it's daunting. And I started to think about how could, I mean, how could we possibly get that going here? And it occurred to me that probably a, a good one would be the, um, the properties that TU, TUSD is disposing of, um, because that does cover, you know, a, a, a square mile. Right. And um, you could, you know, it 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 seems to me that would be a good place to begin doing some examples um, of form-based code. Yep. I don't. Do you agree? <laughs> yeah. No, I do. And and the. Um, if I remember correctly, the, there was an RFP put out um, very recently to, I don't think it was to design what's going to happen, but rather talk about a process and strategies for how they're going to do it. And, you know, I think the, there's still opportunities to think about what, what do we, how do we use buildings and, and landscapes that have been abandoned? Do we have another question? Let's see, two hands going up at once. Be right back over here in a sec, Marty. Can you comment on the fact uh, that there's the city of Tucson, but there's Marana and Oro Valley and Green Valley and unincorporated areas that really make up the population in this area and how they can interact or what or or will they interact to to do some of this? You can't just to me, you can't just do it in Tucson and to heck with everything else. Right. And, and there is the um, Pima Association of Governments, which is the, um, it's a large sort of uh, group of people that, or a group of, of, of the towns and, and unincorporated areas that allow uh, the dialogue to happen, but I think not always successfully. They all have their own interests at, at heart. The, Again, we have to look, take a look at our neighbors. We can take a look at Phoenix and see how Maricopa Association of Governments has done things successfully in some cases and, and not so successfully. They've created a light rail. They've created a sense of, 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 of nodes and, and transportation infrastructure. And as much as we want to bash Phoenix, they're, they're getting some of it right. And, and we have to recognize that and begin to learn from that as another desert city, as a sister desert city. The, the other thing that's going on right now, and I'm not putting a plug in for them necessarily, but um, I will say that um, Imagine Greater Tucson is a new uh, group that's coming together. And their first charge was not to say, we need to come up with um, X number of goals for, for making Tucson a better place, but they're asking for value statements. You know, what are the values that, that compose this community? And I think that's the right place to start is that the first is a recognition of the diversity of values, and the other is to begin to understand that those, the values, as I mentioned in the sequencing of how I made my presentation tonight, values come first. And that if we understand that our values then drive how we begin to make those subsequent decisions, then we're going to have one where there's buy-in, but also that is, is more intelligently thought out than having only one value system coming in and dictating that. Uh, Brooks, uh, as you may know, I work with a lot of local preservation commissions throughout the country, and one of the issues that they have that is related to sustainability is the whole success of the vinyl window industry mm. in terms of pushing the fact that they're energy efficient windows that somehow need to replace every wood window in every historic district in this country. And so you have a real conundrum that these 
historic districts have to deal with because they have homeowners that are trying to do the right thing sure. in terms of energy efficiency and sustainability, but a lot of it is pushed by an industry that if you really look at the long-term sustainability, repairing wood windows in historic properties is a much more sustainable practice than ripping them out, throwing them in the landfill, and then replacing them with vinyl windows that then have to be replaced. So right. I think, I guess I'm just saying that, you know, there, there are these- You've answered your own question. Yeah, I guess I have, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, we have, no, we, we just have to do a really good job of education because these things get very complicated in yep. terms of, again, people are trying to do the right thing, but they're really not doing the right thing in terms of sustainability. When Don Ripkema talked, he talked about the Nature Conservancy tearing right. down a beautiful brick historic building right. in order to build a LEED certified headquarters. Right. And it's like, you know, this just doesn't <coughs> compute. So and now their former executive director is the executive director of the, of National, the National Trust, Trust for Historic for Preservation. Preservation. Yeah. So we ended up actually yeah. winning that, I think, <laughs> in the long run. But anyway, it's just these issues are very complicated, and people need to be careful that, you know, you don't get hooked up in this whole counting points and saying, oh, it's more energy efficient. Things are more complicated than that, and yep. I think those of us that are involved need to be able to say to people, look at the whole building, yep. have somebody come do an energy audit, you know, deal with these things in a more holistic, comprehensive way. Well, and I'll add to that and say that um, there, there is another component to this, and that the, the economics of rehabilitation, the economics of adaptive use are really are weighted toward local labor. So when you restore a building, you are, you know, you're not buying buying vinyl windows in order to replace those wood windows and the vinyl has to be extracted from from raw material and then transported from somewhere else that pays a corporation. If you're restoring your wooden window, you're hiring local expertise and you're investing in the labor. You're investing in your community in that way. And those costs, again, aren't always calculated when we talk about restoration because they're intangible. And so we have to, again, as you said, Marty, to think about the entire picture when we're looking at how we take a look at even something as simple as replacing your window and understand the full impact of that. Santa Rita Hotel, anyone? All right, go. Um, <laughs> I want to comment on the value system you were talking about. Yeah. Um, I rented the last year in Armory Park, and then I just bought an old adobe over in, across the I-10 on Barrio Hollywood, a 1940 old adobe, you know, paid cash, foreclosure. Well, Halloween was just a couple nights ago. This is how I rate my value system. When I was in Armory Park, which is kind of nice in the daytime, but at night it's pretty dead. Uh, no trick-or-treaters at night, but I ran out of candy within a half hour at the Barrio Hollywood. <laughs> I had three bags of candy, and it was embarrassing. I had to go through the fortune cookies and the snack <laughs> peanuts, snack peanuts to give to the kids, but I live between the Monzo Elementary and the Catholic Church in a barrio, and it's uh, 75% Hispanic. I feel diverse. It feels alive. The kids are riding their bikes at night till 10 o'clock. They're playing basketball across the street. They're skateboarding. I'm going to die in that house. I don't want to be in Armory Park when it's dead at 6 o'clock at night. I want to be alive, you know, and hear everybody. Then what I'll challenge you, I'll challenge you to do is deconstruct that whole scene and say, why is it different? What makes it successful? It's because it's alive 24 hours a day. Yeah, Whether it's fireworks why? or gunshots, it's alive. <laughs> 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 I, I put solar hot water on it right away, and I've replaced the windows, and it had, had a gray water system, and has a solar dryer outside, but... Um, <laughs> my clothesline. Everybody has a clothesline in the barrio, so I liked it. I fit it right in. <laughs> so yeah, it fits my value system. And not all value systems are the same. Another question. Brooke, speaking of not all value systems being the same, 
Um, do you have any comments on the so-called mini dorm problem? <laughs> <laughs> yes, no you knew this was coming. <laughs> Where we're, we're, we're working with values on the one hand of <coughs> economic uh, bottom line and you know, outsiders coming in to do what they think needs to be done. And, and in, in their defense, they are doing a certain amount of infill development. And you know, there could be an arguments made for um, in that regard. But then you've got the reaction of the community on the other side very much against what's being done, that it does not fit in with their value system. And I'm just kind of wondering, is there any way to reconcile this? If the university were investing in housing the way they should, I think that they would mitigate some of that problem. Um, but at the same time, I think there is a, um, a desire in the part of the university is to actually um, in the freshman and perhaps the sophomore year to create a sense of community on campus and that there's a mandatory requirement for that, but then the, to move out in the community. And as Damien knows, um, we, Dale is in Jefferson Park and we just are finishing up a, Damien and a group of students are finishing up a National Register nomination for, uh, for um, Rincon Heights, which is on the south side of the university. And they are, they are sister neighborhoods in many ways. But one of the things that was unique about uh, Rincon Heights was the fact that it always, because it was close to Armory Park and Iron Horse, it always had this sort of little tenant rooms that were part of the buildings. There was an accommodation for single people that would come in that were at first because of the railroad and then later as the orientation of these single people shifted to the university, the buildings accommodated them. But if you were to go down the street and you were to take a first blush at a neighborhood, at a streetscape, you would say that this is all one cohesive whole kind of neighborhood. It's only when the economics begins to take over, where land is the commodity, as opposed to sort of creating an environment, a community. Because we're really talking about the difference between creating a community, which were, you know, the early developers were really talking about. Yes, there was an economic component, but they wanted to create a sense of community. And today it's about people who are making the biggest bang for their buck, and, and land is a commodity. And to hell with, with character, to hell with community. It's really about their bottom line and not necessarily contributing to, to a larger community. So if I have a comment about it is that developers of any parcel, particularly redevelopment, needs to prove that they are contributing to the sense of community of a neighborhood. That that should be part of a regulatory <coughs> process and that should be done in very tangible ways. It includes things like understanding the context of setbacks, understanding the context of scale, of form, all of those kinds of things. So it's not just land use, I can do this because the land use code allows me to, but rather form-based, again, the idea of contributing to character of a particular neighborhood, consistent with the character of that neighborhood. And then enters politics. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's why I say we can't, we can't divorce ourselves from that. I can't think of politics and, and policies and things like that as dirty words. We have to go to bed with them. Question over here. Is there a mechanism through which an existing neighborhood can work to become sustainable? I, I live in a neighborhood of individual family homes. We have some acreage that we could put to good use, say for solar power or something like that. How do we begin such a project? Yeah, that's a really good question. And that's, that's the point where we're, we're starting to develop design studios around. So it's one thing to talk about a theory and a series of principles that you can begin to, to, to look at in abstract. The other thing is to test them and begin to say, okay, let's take a look at where I live. I live in Poets Corner. So let's take a look at that neighborhood. Incredibly unsustainable when you talk about it based on these kinds of principles, you know, but it's close to Broadway. Okay, we have a transportation corridor. How can we create a node at Alvernon and, and Broadway? and that begins to bleed off. And how do we take a typical suburban kind of neighborhood and begin to approach this? And there'll be different strategies for those kind of neighborhoods versus the armory parks, 
versus the the Miramontes. the Miramontes or you know yeah Tucson Country Club would somebody say that Tucson Estates yeah I mean you know there's got to be different approaches but they're not out there yet and and that's where again we need to apply these principles test them and see where where the ideas come up same thing with downtown can we offer up a test case sure <laughs> <laughs> Brooks, <laughs> I'll go this easy on This is the on heckling that. table here. No, 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 no. Where are your photographs? <laughs> <laughs> no, you did a very good job without them. I, I'm not sure how you did it. Um, no, I've been uh, involved with uh, green building design in, in Tucson. I've uh, been an architect here for, for 26 years. Understood the history and all of that. Uh, we've, um, Marty and several of us, uh, ran a uh, uh, Tucson uh, Community Design Academy for education. And it seems to me there are two things that, that the great unwashed herd out there understands. Economics and health. And so I think framing framing sustainability in the advantages to the economy and the advantages to the health seems to me that, that is a value system that is most generally accepted. Mm -hmm. All the others, environmental and yep. um, aesthetic and, yep. and, and everything else, they, de they depend on, um, on opinion and some other value system. Yep. So I'm, I'm encouraged because I think we are headed towards decisions that are hinging on our health yep. and on our economy. Yep. And so I have hope that uh, eventually we'll get there. But it takes groups like this. It takes um, you know, a lot of individuals doing individual things to you know, keep, keep pushing the rock up the hill. But I think uh, we're headed there, whether we like it or not. You know, Mother Nature has has last bat, yep. <laughs> so she's going to win. Yep. But um, so anyway, that's just my my uh, c comment on it. And I think if we if we we th think about all these issues in economic terms, we think about them in health terms. I think we will will make uh, 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 strides. You know what I'm really encouraged by uh, is there was a recent, um, in the Obama administration, was the first, first administration to actually begin to bundle federal funding between housing and urban development, Department of Transportation, and Environmental Protection Agency. Mm -hmm. And actually bundle those three agencies together to say, if you're going after money, you're going after money that, that deals with all three of those things, which is exactly what you're talking about. And so finally, the feds are getting it, and they're understanding. Well, I, no, I don't. I, I, I disagree with that. But I, but it's the idea that you know, for a long time, we were handicapped because we're 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 governed by our funding, and our our funding then drives. And if the feds are what's driving the funding, then we need to change the feds. And so I'm I'm really encouraged by that. The other thing that I I think is really important. I mentioned to it before is the idea that for the first time, the Drachman Institute is working with public health and we're getting uh, funding from uh, the National Institutes of Health working with Pima County to, to uh, work on that relationship between public health and designed environments. And I mentioned before, you know, there is an obesity problem in this country and it's not just about nutrition. It's about our inability in our, in our, in our communities to have walkable, safe neighborhoods. And so if we begin to make those connections between not just the scientists who are dealing with nutrition, but also the designers who are dealing with environments, we can begin to understand that interrelatedness. And once you begin to make that connection, people begin to see it in a different way. Their lens changes about it. The other thing that I wanted to share with you that, that we were a part of that I think is a critical, <coughs> critical uh, problem in this community as well as other communities is um, housing, um, housing and transportation affordability. And there was a study that was done that, you know, this whole notion of drive until you qualify, 
means that people are having to go further and further outside of the city in order to qualify for loans to be able to purchase a house, going back to affordability and, and economics or sustainability. But that is hardly sustainable when you have to drive 30 miles one way to get from your house to the place of your work. So this idea that housing affordability, which used to be a metric based on your medium income, is now having to add transportation costs, not just the sort of costs of, of your house, but the transportation costs for you to qualify in order to live so far away, in order to really be a, an appropriate metric for understanding true housing affordability. That's an incredible leap of, of understanding that we need to get our heads around in order to, to combine that notion of sustainability from an economic point of view, as well as a social and environmental one. Where's the beer? Well, this has been an incredible, incredible evening. And Brooks, thank you so much. This is just fantastic. Welcome.